All right. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Tad Jones. I'm the executive director here at the Will Rogers Memorial Museum, and this is a part of our lecture series, and I'm just absolutely thrilled to have, uh, I want to say Congressman, he keeps saying, no, just call me Jim, uh, Jim Bridenstein here. I got to meet Jim a number of years ago when I was in the Oklahoma legislature, and he was head of the uh, Tulsa Air and Space Museum, and we found out we had a great mutual respect for the FIRST Robotics Program, a program that I supported when I was in the legislature, and a program that is heavily involved with NASA and uh, getting and I need to get my two kids back there in the first robotics program as well so it's really an excellent program for the youth and getting them involved in loving uh, in STEM uh, science and technology. A uh, quick introduction here before I let our uh, guest speak. Uh, Congressman Bridenstein graduated from Rice University and joined the Navy in 1998 and became a pilot flying E-2 Seahawkeyes and F-18 Hornets. In 2008, he became director of the Tulsa Air and Space Museum, and he was elected to the United States Congress in 2012 and served on the Committee on Armed Services and the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. In September of 2017, he was nominated by President Trump to serve as director of NASA. He was confirmed and sworn in as director on April 23, 2018. He stepped down as director earlier this year and is working for Acorn Growth Companies as a senior advisor, and he's married uh, to Michelle. They live in Tulsa and have three children who are swimmers. Is that correct? Yes. Everyone, please welcome uh, Jim Bridenstein. Test. All right. It's my NASA training coming in right there. i got to hit the button right. Um, okay, so, yeah, it's great to be here. And uh, Todd, I just want to thank you for inviting me and putting this together. And um, I always love to, to talk about not just NASA, but space in general and why it's important for all of us in this room. And I think in many ways, many, a lot of people don't realize how space affects our everyday lives. As the NASA administrator, I often get questions like, why, why, why do we go to the moon when we've got all these problems here on Earth? Why do we want to go to Mars? We've got all these problems here on Earth. That question continues to come up. Doesn't matter where I go or what I'm doing, there's always somebody that wants to second guess why we would do space exploration. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of frame, I'll frame why we explore space, then I'll frame some of the challenges that we have um, and what we need to do about it, uh, and then I'll talk about some programs that I think are important, and then we'll open it up for questions or however you want to do it, Tad, over, over to you on that. Um, but it's great to be here at the Will Rogers Museum. I would start by saying that it's appropriate we are here um, at the Will Rogers Memorial. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Will Rogers was a huge advocate of pushing the, the edge of the boundary when it comes to exploration. In his day, it was aviation, but he was an enthusiast for aviation. He and Wiley Post teamed up on a number of very innovative projects, and I know I'm talking to an audience that probably knows all of this already, uh, but certainly Wiley Post, a fa another famous Oklahoman, an aviator, flew around the world multiple times, always breaking the record, sometimes breaking his own record, uh, flying around the world in the, the least amount of time, uh, and then also starting to, to, for the first time, understand what the jet stream was. Flying around the world isn't enough. He's got to go faster. When you go faster, you got to get into the jet stream. The only way to get in the jet stream is to go higher. So he started, he was the first person to start flying with pressurized suits that became kind of the foundation for what we now understand as a spacesuit. And of course, um, Will Rogers' role in that, apart from just having fun and going on the flights and being fr a friend of, of Wiley Post, his role in that was really promotion normalizing aviation in a time when it really wasn't normalized. It was, in those days, a lot of barnstormers and airmail pilots, but it needed to be normalized, and he really wanted to make sure that it became part of uh, our everyday lives, and that's what Real, Will Rogers did, and ultimately, unfortunately, that's how he died. Um, but I'll tell you, the legacy is important, and um, it is perfectly appropriate for the NASA administrator to want to come to the Will Rogers Memorial to talk about these very innovative things. So why do we explore space? Well, there's a lot of people here that probably have direct TV, maybe Dish Network. Maybe you have internet broadband from space. Um, a lot of people in rural Oklahoma, if you don't have internet broadband from space, you probably don't have internet broadband. 
Um, when we think about XM radio or how we do uh, for national security purposes, how do we, how do we zap uh, high resolution motion picture images all over the world, lickety split for the purpose of decision makers making real time decisions uh, for you know targeting or, or something else. These capabilities are all communication based capabilities that were born from concepts built by NASA going back to the 1950s. Space based communication, but it's not just communication, it's communication, it's navigation. I mean, I'm sure everybody here understands GPS and how that's been fundamentally transformational for how all of us do things. It's also important to recognize with GPS, every banking transaction in the United States of America is dependent on a timing signal from GPS. We lose the GPS signal, we lose banking in our country. That becomes an existential threat. You lose banking, there's no milk in the grocery store in a matter of hours. That's, that's how serious it is. So GPS signal is critically important for the national security of our country. From a banking perspective, it becomes existential. But it's not just banking, it's how we regulate flows of electricity on the power grid. If you lose, if you lose the GPS signal, the you can't regulate the flows of electricity and of course the power grid will die. We think about how we regulate flows of, elect of uh, data. On our, I was looking for my cell phone. Data on our terrestrial wireless networks. You need a GPS timing signal to be able to do those things. So all of these things would be fundamentally transformational in a negative way if somebody were able to destroy GPS. By the way, the enemies of the United States, or I should say the competitors of the United States that may one day become enemies, are advancing capabilities to not just destroy J GPS, but to destroy space entirely. This is a big challenge. So we think about how we communicate, how we navigate, how we produce food. Right now, NASA is working on projects where we're going to increase crop yields while reducing water usage by 25% and preserving nitrates in the soil. And, and the reason it's important to preserve nitrates in the soil, that's how you increase crop yields, number one. But number two, then you don't have to clean those nitrates out of the soil for, for, for our drinking water. A lot of those nitrates, they wash away, they get into our drinking water. It takes billions of dollars to clean our drinking water every year. So these are projects that I think are going to be transformational for how we live as humanity. Navigation, um, communication, producing food, producing energy. One of the big projects happening right now here in the state of Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma, is a mission called GeoCarb. GeoCarb is going to, this was kind of a project of mine, but it happened before I got to NASA. Um, I was a big advocate of hosted payloads. Think of a commercial communication satellite. You in this room can think of how you receive direct TV or dish network in geostationary orbit. I was a big advocate of taking that satellite bus and attaching to it sensors that can be used for all of humanity. So I, I, I really worked hard to make sure that hosted payloads were part of legislation on the Armed Services Committee, the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, but we, we, we got a mission at NASA before I was the NASA administrator where the University of Oklahoma, which is the best university on the planet when it comes to understanding weather, the University of Oklahoma is going to put a sensor on a commercial communication payload. Um, and of course, the sensor is funded by NASA. And this sensor is going to let us know every time there's a greenhouse gas emission somewhere in the, in the Western Hemisphere. So we'll be able to see it instantaneously, whether it's a methane leak, um, you know, some kind of leak from a gas pipeline or from a train or from a wherever, wherever the leak's coming from, we'll find it from space. We'll be able to respond immediately. And the, the and the, the, the inter interesting thing is, this is another thing I love about NASA. Of course, environmentalists love that. But you know who else loves it? The energy companies. <laughs> Why? Because then they won't get fined by the EPA. So, so here you have an alignment between environmental groups and energy companies to do something that's good for all of us, which is prevent greenhouse gas leaks. And there's a lot of different greenhouse gases out there that leak uh, from time to time that we would never know otherwise, except we're going to be able to detect it from space. So the way we produce food and energy, the way we do national security and defense, the way we do disaster relief, critically important, uh, the way we understand climate. And I know people, a lot of people say, well, NASA shouldn't do climate. I hear that quite frequently as well. 
Um, and we can all argue about what to do about what we learn regarding the climate. We can certainly have those arguments. Policy arguments are very legitimate. I think it is absolutely appropriate that we make sure we learn what's happening regarding our climate. Whatever side you're on, you should not be afraid of the data and information. And that's what we provide from space. We get really good data and information, and we make that data and information available to the world for free. That's what we do at NASA. Now, we don't get involved, at least when I was there, we didn't get involved at NASA. We didn't get involved in what to do about what we learn. That's up to policymakers that aren't involved in just collecting the data and doing the science and delivering the information to the policymakers. So uh, we think about um, all of these different capabilities. Prediction of weather. Think about this for a second. Eight, you get up in the morning, you turn on channel 6, channel 8, channel 2, whatever channel you watch. I don't want to upset anybody. Maybe Fox 23, whatever it is. You turn on your television and you see the green blob. And you know that that green blob is going to come to your neck of the woods at some point in the day. That's a pretty accurate prediction. That green blob, 80% of the data comes from space. Weather satellites. Weather satellites that are built by NASA for NOAA. Uh, and of course we have government contractors, uh, big prime, prime contractors that build those on behest of NASA, but our, of course our NASA team is very involved in those projects. So we think about all these different capabilities for, come from space, the way we communicate, navigate, produce food, produce energy, uh, do disaster relief, national security and defense. Uh, and, then, and then we think about weather and climate. All of these capabilities that we depend on every day and going back to communications, going back to GPS, we think about the power grid, we think about wireless networks, your cell phone, we, we think about the banking system. Every single one of us in this room every day is dependent on space, period. And the enemies around the, United, around the world know that the United States is dependent on space far more than they are dependent on space. That's why they're building these very challenging capabilities. So they're, they're advancing things like anti-satellite missiles, which we see from time to time be tested and read about it in the newspaper. We, we see stories about co-orbital anti-satellites. So a satellite that would fly in formation with another satellite with the purpose of destroying it, potentially. Remember, capability doesn't necessarily mean that the will is there or that the desire is there, but if the capability is there, it's something we need to be concerned with. Um, and so these are all, all th th what I'm saying is because we are so dependent on space, people say, th you see around the world, people are, are making it a threat now. They're, they're threatening space. What's interesting is as the NASA administrator, I would go around talking places and people would be like, oh yeah, space, you know, it's so important. You know, we've got things like, like Tang and, and Velcro come from space. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> There's been a lot that's happened since then. <laughs> Make no mistake, those were products that were really promoted by and used by NASA, but there's so much more out there that we are all dependent on. And I think most people are not aware of it. So it's very important um, that, that we continue to do kind of these groundbreaking things as it, as it relates to space exploration um, and discovery. Um, okay, so so I think what I want to talk about next is some of the projects that NASA has underway. And remember, wh when I was in the House of Representatives, NASA is a piece of our space enterprise as a nation. When I, was, uh, in the when I was on the Armed Services Committee in the House of Representatives, I was part of a small group of members of Congress that were focused, like a laser, on creating this thing we now call the Space Force. Um, this, was, this was before President Trump was really talking about it. We called it the Space Corps. We didn't call it the Space Force. Uh, we called it the Space Corps because it would report to the Secretary of the Air Force, just like the Marine Corps reports to the Secretary of the Navy. So it's within the Department of the Navy. This would be in, within the Department of the Air Force. Ultimately, that organizational structure stayed, um, but the President liked the word Space Force better because it sounds better. Um, and of course he was the president, so he gets to make the decision. Which I think was actually a really good move because people understand it better. And I think that's, that's it. understanding it is how you get Americans to buy in on, on the program. By the way, when I was in the House and we passed that bill, we passed that bill in the House of Representatives 
with 344 bipartisan votes as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. It was not a partisan thing at all. People who were aware of what was going on, <laughs> they, all, they all knew what we needed to do, and, and, and we, we acted on it. Um, back in those days, we kept passing it in the House, and the Senate kept killing it. Um, but we eventually got past that, and the, the bill is now law, and in fact, the President signed it. Um, and we now have another branch of the armed services that I think is critically important. Um, it's a new domain that actually has to, it absolutely has to be defended. Um, so NASA, so where does NASA play? Um, we're not the Space Force. We're not part of the Department of Defense. We were intentionally created separately from the Department of Defense because President Eisenhower did not want NASA to be part of what he called the military industrial complex. The Army at the time wanted to control and, and manage space. And, and Eisenhower was absolutely against it. And when he, passed, when he, he, he negotiated with Congress to get this, this space program underway called NASA, he wanted it to be its own independent agency outside the umbrella of the Department of Defense. Why? Because when you look at the, when you look at the elements of national power that are important for our country, uh, in the military, we use an acronym. With, it's called DIME, D-I-M-E. Diplomatic power, information power, military power, and economic power. Now, that acronym, where does NASA play in there? Diplomatic power. Right now, we have 15 nations that operate the International Space Station. Half of the International Space Station is Russian. You, you know the terrestrial challenges we have with Russia here on Earth. Um, and and we, we see it in all the time, the, the invasion of South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia. We see the invasion of Crimea in the Ukraine. We, we see all of these things, and of course, um, uh, we, we think it's terrible. And, and, and we, we, we not only don't support it, we sanction them for those activities. On the other side, it's very important to have a channel of communication so that people don't make mistakes that can ultimately lead to very dangerous, even more dangerous situations. So there is a tool here of diplomacy where NASA plays. It's why we're not in the Department of Defense. NASA is able to, to work with Russia in space exploration, whether it's low Earth orbit or maybe even eventually the moon. It is a, it is a tool of diplomacy. Fifteen nations operate the International Space Station. We've had astronauts from 19 different nations. Um, and of course now, um, you know, we're putting together the moon program and we're building the largest coalition in the history of the world to go to the moon under what we call Artemis, which is our return to the moon, um, this time to stay, and ultimately our plan to get to Mars. So we, we think about the tool of diplomacy. One other thing on diplomacy. Everybody thinks of NASA, they think of human spaceflight. We have lots and lots of projects that are not human spaceflight. So I talked a little bit about some of our weather projects. I talked about our, our, our understanding of climate. We've got, we've got satellites that are at the sun right now, if you can imagine that. We have the Parker Solar Probe is flying through the atmosphere of the sun. Talk about an engineering nightmare. But we got it done, and it's delivering amazing data. Why do we need that data? Because when we go to Mars... When we go to the moon, a lot of people don't realize this, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, when they were on the moon, had they been there just hours later, they would have been hit by a, a, a solar flare. And, and that very well could have killed them quickly. They missed it, but it wasn't because we were trying to miss it, it was because we didn't know any better. And now we know better, and now we have to, be, we have to get really good at predicting solar flares and corona mass ejections from the sun. So we've got probes right now at the sun, one of which is actually flying through the solar corona, and which is the, the atmosphere of the sun, um, and giving us great data and information so we can make those predictions in the future. Um, we have, so we have, that's called heliophysics, the study of the sun. We also have earth science, and I talked a little bit about that already. We have planetary science, where we're sending probes to every planet throughout the solar system, and we just landed um, Perseverance on Mars, for the first time in human history, we, we flew a helicopter on Mars, which, by the way, might have been my doing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give myself credit for that one. There was a lot of resistance to flying that helicopter on Mars because the hardest part of landing on Mars is entry, descent, and landing. 
And if you say, okay, we're going to attach a helicopter to the bottom of this lander, everything that, that the engineers have been working on gets thrown out the window. Well, I showed up and I said, that's what we're going to do. And so they weren't, some of them, a lot of, some of them were very supportive. A lot of them were very resistant. And it adds risk. And of course, we're talking about billions of dollars going into these programs and you're adding risk to it. But in my view, flying a helicopter on another planet for the first time in human history, that's a Wright Brothers type moment. Um, and it can be transformational for how we explore all the other planets and moons of the other planets in the solar system. So being able to prove that as a technology demonstrator I thought was critically important and we got it done and it's been very, very successful. So guess what? Now we can take helicopters to other planets and other moons of other planets. The moons are where it gets really, really interesting. So we've got this entire division about planetary science um, and then we've got astrophysics which is the study of deep space. The reason I'm telling you this, whether it's Heliophysics, planetary science, earth science, astrophysics. We've got many, many, many missions out there in space. And, and of those missions, we have, we have over 700 agreements, international agreements, on the missions that we have in space. So again, I'm, I'm emphasizing the D in dime, diplomacy. That is a great tool that NASA brings to our country. It's a tool that I think a lot of legislators and national leaders don't think about when they think people think about NASA they think about science they think maybe about prestige that kind of thing but they don't think about the tool of diplomacy which can actually be transformational for avoiding war which of course those of us who have fought in wars we want to make sure we avoid those um, and by the way everybody else I didn't I didn't mean to sound that way <laughs> um, Okay, so there, there's the tool of diplomacy. Then you've got the I and dime, information power. I know I'm going to get I'm going to get into the questions here, Tom. The I. We think about Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landing on the moon. We think about before that Apollo 8 orbiting the moon. You know, when, when our astronauts orbited the moon, we were in the middle of the Cold War. Massive competition, great power competition between the United States of America and the Soviet Union. It, we were trying to. We were. Te it was a test of. Of of you know, economic systems, political systems, technological capability, all of these, all of these very important things where we had to prove that the United States of America was, was, was superior than totalitarian regime over there in the Soviet Union. And our astronauts on Apollo 8, when they were around the moon, they, they had the opportunity to not just communicate to America, they had the opportunity to communicate to the entire planet at one time. And they had that opportunity on Christmas Eve, 1968. They didn't land. This was Apollo, uh, Apollo 10, where they just orbited the moon. But on Apollo 10, when they orbited the moon, um, actually, this would have been Apollo 8. They orbited the moon for the first time. And our astronauts, Jim Lovell among them, uh, they read on Christmas Eve the book of Genesis for the entire world to hear. And they wished everybody a Merry Christmas. Now, you think that's not a big deal, right? Some, well, that's not a big deal. They read from the book of Genesis. Well, if you're in the Soviet Union and Christmas is illegal and you've got the radio on and you're listening for the first time in humanity to humans in orbit around the moon, it was the first time ever that we saw an Earth rise over the horizon, got a picture of it, zapped it back, and everybody on the planet saw it. And those astronauts on that night, Christmas Eve, decided to share with the world uh, the creation story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was the story they wanted to share. Uh, that's, great, that, that's a great tool of information power. And by the way, nobody at NASA and nobody in the government told them to do that. In fact, afterwards they got sued and they were told not to do it again. Um, but when, when they did it, um, when they did it, it they, they wanted, the, the, what they were told to say... <laughs> And they didn't know what they were going to say as they were getting there. They, they made the decision on the way to the moon. What they were told to say is something profound. And they decided that that was going to be what they said that was profound. And I think it's the perfect message for the world at that time that people needed to hear. Okay, so then, then we fast forward um, to the M and dime, which is military power. And, and by the way, that I and dime, I want to anchor there one more second. What, what my first, when I first got to NASA, we launched this, this mission uh, to, um, to Mars, and it was, um, uh, it, it was, a, it was basically a lander that was going to help us understand the inside of Mars. It landed on Mars, 
Um, it's called Insight. People liked the mission, but it really wasn't that big of a deal because it was just a lander, not a rover. It wasn't a helicopter. It was just going to land and help us understand the history of Mars. When that thing landed on Mars, it was on the cover of every newspaper worldwide. That's when I was like, ooh, that eye and dime that I learned about when I was in the, the, the Navy, that's a powerful eye when it comes to NASA. It, and, and by the way, when I say it, it was, on the, it was in the newspaper in Tehran. And by the way, the, sub, the subtitle on the newspaper was, it was the, the hardline newspaper of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. I don't know if you know about the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Tehran, but they don't say nice things about the United States of America. And in this particular case, they had a story in their newspaper about landing on Mars with the InSight lander, which we thought was pretty cool, but not the biggest thing NASA's ever done. It was like the seventh time we've landed on Mars. Um, and, and it talked, the last paragraph of that article talked all about the international partners that were with us. And you think about the ability to change the perceptions of young people all over the world towards the United States of America. They're not getting good information about who we are, what, what our country is all about. And here we have an opportunity to reach not just behind the Iron Curtain like we did back in the 1960s, but now we're reaching into Tehran when they're getting a lot of bad information about who we are as Americans. So I think that's a great capability for our country. So diplomatic power, information power, military power, we intentionally don't play there. That's not what NASA is. It's not what NASA does. I will, sell, I will say that when it comes to technological advancement, there's some overlap there for sure. Um, our military takes advantage of it, and NASA takes advantage probably more so. What the military does, NASA takes advantage of than the other way around. Um, so there, there's that as well. Then we think about the E in dime is economic power. And we talked earlier about how dependent all of us are on space. That's that economic power. We are preeminent in space, and these technologies have transformed and improved our economy in ways that, you know, 50 years ago nobody could have imagined. When they said we're going to go to the moon, how many people think that all of these capabilities and technologies that we're dependent on, how many people thought, oh, we need to do it for those reasons? No, they didn't do it for those reasons. They didn't. Nobody could even suspect that we would be as dependent on space today as we are. But we went because it was the right thing to do from all the other reasons. But he, I'm going to anchor just one second on the E. On the International Space Station right now, we are proving that we can create immunizations on the ISS, International Space Station, that we cannot create here in the gravity well of Earth. That's going to be, in fact, we, we've done it for salmonella. People say, why do you need an immunization for salmonella? Well, because it's the third leading cause of death of infants in, you know, Africa and in other uh, unindustrialized parts of the world. Uh, that's a big deal. Here in the United States, people are like, well, that's not a big deal. Well, in other parts of the world, it is a huge deal. So, and, and uh, we have advanced immunizations for pneumonia, which, is, of course, is very important. But it's also about... Um, Pharmaceuticals. We can compound pharmaceuticals on the International Space Station in the way you can't do in the gravity well of Earth. We can do things like uh, we, we're right now working to print human tissue in 3D on the International Space Station. So we can take your own DNA. We could come over here. We could take some skin from Tad. And I'm not talking about pulling it off his body. I'm talking about some, some skin cells that he would never even miss if we took them take some skin cells from Tad, we could launch them to space, and we could create his own tissue in the microgravity of space that he can then use. And oh, by the way, th th so these are adult stem cells, but, but it's also important to recognize that um, right now it's tissue in the future, and maybe not, not too distant future, it's going to be full organs. So we're going to be able to, to do all those kind of capabilities as well. It's also true we're advancing a, a technology right now, and there's so much. We don't even know the value of microgravity. We have no idea what that value is. But I'm telling you, it's valuable. We just don't know what it is yet. We're just starting to scrape the surface. There's like this big iceberg out there, and we see this tip of it. But when we think about another technology that I think is important is, and I've talked about this a lot, creating an artificial retina for the human eyeball using advanced um, materials. So in the microgravity of space, 
you can create materials that are so thin that they're one atom thick or two atoms thick. That means you can create an artificial retina for the human eyeball, something you can't do within the gravity well of Earth. So imagine taking a box that fits in the palm of your hand, and in that box are all the materials and all the robotics to create a thousand artificial retinas. You send it up to space. A couple months later, it comes back down. Each one of those artificial retinas is reimbursed by Medicare to the tune of $75,000 a piece. All of a sudden, that business case closes, and there's going to be people that are going to want to capitalize sending materials and robots to space. That's one example. There's a lot of others when it comes to advanced materials and capabilities that are going to be transformational for humankind. Um, so that's the E in dime. It's important to remember diplomatic power, information power, military power, economic power. NASA is playing in all those roles for our country, not in the M. And maybe in the M to the extent that we you know, have some overlap in technology when it comes to launch and satellite buses and those kind of things. Um, so with that, I'll just say it's awesome to be here. Um, and I'm more than happy to open it up to questions and certainly uh, do the best I can to answer them. So I see some people with some NASA shirts. I see some people with some a SpaceX hat. Um, if I don't know the answer, maybe I can defer. Well, I've got a few questions that have been sent to us, and I'll be asking as well. And <clears throat> I was excited about space before, but now I am really excited about space. I mean, I grew up with Star Wars and Star Trek, and, you know, I'm ready to be there tomorrow and go. So I, I want to ask the first question, then we'll open it up, and what we'll do when we answer, ask questions. You ask your question, then I'll repeat it so the microphone can pick it up for our YouTube audience as well. But uh, my first question is, because I want to see us all in space, and I'm, I believe in the human spirit that we, we want to explore, and I know President Trump mentioned Mars. It's been mentioned before by other presidents. What is the reality and maybe the time frame that we can get to, and I, you mentioned uh, back to the moon, to the moon and uh, having humans on Mars? Yeah, so, um, so there's uh, uh, the, the easy answer is it depends. I mean, um, so it, but it really does. It depends on budgets. It depends on will. It depends on those, those types of things. Um, I think, it's, I think it's doable that we could be on Mars in the 2030s. Um, we, a lot of, we have to work on a lot of things and make them go right. Um, the challenge with Mars, people are like, well, we went to the moon. Why can't we just go to Mars? The, the challenge with Mars is that Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. So when you go to, the, when you go to Mars, when you get there, you can't come home. You're no longer aligned with the Earth. So you've got to travel all the way around the sun for 26 months, and then you, there will be an alignment between Earth and Mars again when you can come home. That's a big challenge. So when you go to Mars, you've got to be willing to stay. You know, Elon Musk talks about going to Mars and be, being willing to die there. Well, I, I don't know that that's the plan. That's not the plan of the American government, but I can tell you there's a lot of enthusiasts that are, that are on that, on that you know, train, of, train of thought, which is, I guess that's their prerogative. But I don't think that's Elon's plan either. I just want to be really clear. That's, that's not his goal. Um, he wants to move humanity to Mars. Um, but I, I would also say there's some challenges that have to be addressed. The radiation dose that you get on the way to Mars is a lot. And it takes nine months to get to Mars. So nine months of radiation, not just from the sun, but also radiation from deep space, which is even worse than the radiation from the sun. Um, nine months of living in microgravity. A lot of people don't realize microgravity is very challenging on your body. Your, your immune system degrades. That's why we've been studying all these immune, you know, kind of immune, immunology. I'm not a doctor, but like all these different things that we're studying on the International Space Station. We're trying to, not just your immune system, you, you, lose, you lose your muscle mass. You lose your bone mass. You lose one to three percent of your bone mass Every month, you're on the International Space Station. That's, that's pretty significant. Um, so, and, and, and there's other challenges with pressure in the brain and how it changes your eyesight because of the microgravity. Um, there's a lot of challenges with humans in space that have to be resolved. A lot of that needs to be addressed by getting, almost all of it can be addressed by getting there faster. So when we talk about a nine-month journey to Mars, you got to cut that down by 
maybe half or more. Well, how do you do that? We need nuclear propulsion. Um, we, we need, we need a, not just nuclear thermal propulsion, we need nuclear electric propulsion. Um, we, we need nuclear thermal first, but we need nuclear electric eventually. And then we'll be able to get to anywhere we want within the solar system within, within a matter of, of months. Um, and that's, that's an important capability that we need to develop. Um, we've been funding it at NASA in small amounts. Um, we've not been funding it at the levels that we should be funding it uh, to get serious about getting to Mars in the mid-2030s. And by the way, the, the Mars mission in 2030s probably wouldn't have nuclear power anyway. It would, it would likely be conventional and we would spend nine months getting there. Um, we would have probably shielding on the spacecraft and that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I think the 2030s is the realistic um, effort. Um, a lot has to be done between now and then. I think the biggest thing that we have to do is get to the moon. We haven't been to the moon since 1972. I was the first NASA administrator in history that wasn't alive when we had people living and walking on the moon. I was born in 1975, so I never got to see any of that until, until I saw it on reruns. Um, <laughs> I, we did watch it when I was when I was in I think it was either kindergarten or first grade. We watched the Apollo 11 moon landing, um, but 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 look, my my memories as a young child of big, you know, what are the what are the things that happen in your life where you know exactly where they were when they happened? You walk around NASA, everybody that's of age, they all know exactly where they were when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. You know what I remember? I remember where I was. Fifth grade, Mrs. Powers walks in the classroom, tears coming down her face, crying because of the Challenger. And I remember the teachers huddling, and all, all of us were like, what's going on? This was the Krista McAuliffe flight, the first teacher in space. All the teachers were following this. This was a part of the education curriculum. Uh, they brought in the TVs. They didn't know what to do, but they just showed it to us. Uh, I was in fifth grade, and they brought in the TVs, and we watched the challenge. Like, I remember that like yesterday. I can't remember anything else other than fifth grade other than the movie Top, Top Gun. I remember Top Gun <laughs> kind of transformed my life in a way. Um, it, it fundamentally did transform my life, I should say that. Um, but but, but we, we, need to, we need to do those stunning achievements again where everybody on the planet knows where they were when that stunning achievement happened. And it needs to inspire the next generation of Americans to do more stunning things. We had that in the Apollo program. It's why we created the Artemis program, and it's why we're going back to the moon with the purpose of learning how to get to Mars. That's what Artemis is all about. Happy to talk about Artemis too, but I'll, I'll go to the next question. All right, well that is exciting. I, I remember seeing a documentary one time, or a, or a special, and it talked about a couple that all they did was make food for preparation of going to Mars and they were experimenting on you know how long the food can last and those kind of things and you think of all the things that have to go into that process is uh, is pretty amazing it's also important to remember that we can go to Mars and use the resources of Mars to live one of the reasons we go to the moon is because there's hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the surface of the moon especially on the South Pole in those cold traps the the craters there's pure water ice on the moon. Water, what, water ice represents oxygen, H2O, so there's oxygen there. That's air to breathe. Obviously, it's water for drinking. It's hydrogen, which is fuel. There's, like, that's, that's a big chunk of what you need when, when you want to live on another planet. Um, not that the moon is a planet. But it's also true that Mars has pure water ice. We sent a lander to, to Mars called Phoenix, Landed on the North Pole, it's, a, it's an ice cap. It picked up a scoop of ice and it was pure water ice. By the way, on Mars, so, there, there, so there's recent, by the way, carbon dioxide is the atmosphere of Mars. Well, carbon dioxide, there's oxygen there. There's, so one of the things we did when I was there, we, we launched um, Perseverance to Mars and Perseverance, this robot, has a mission called MOXIE, which converts the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars into pure oxygen. We, we're trying to figure out right now how do we use the resources of another planet to live and work on that other planet. Because then we don't have to carry everything with us, which is a huge, huge cost. Um, so these are all, all things that are happening right now to make those possible. 
Well, I thought it was easy to get to Mars. I have kids, and uh, we watched the movie Rocket Man. Yeah. It's a comedy. you got to have little kids to enjoy it, but I thought it was easy to get there. So, cute movie. But anyway, all right, questions from the audience in the very back. Is that what the road is cut off? The question... The question is about tourism and tourism in space. Yeah, so I'm a big advocate of this. Um, so as the NASA administrator, a lot of people don't realize that, that, that uh, you know, when you think about uh, a lot of this tourism activity, a lot of it is funded, in fact, by NASA. And e even the parts of it that are not funded by NASA, NASA engineers are working on things that are, that are involved here. Why? Because we do public-private partnerships. Um, the, the goal at NASA is, and, and I'm hoping it stays this way, it ought to stay this way, especially given everything that's happening right now, but when I was there I talked a lot about NASA needs to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit, specifically. We need to be one of many customers. That will drive down costs to the American taxpayer. That means that these commercial companies need to go get customers that are not NASA. And that's what you're seeing right now, which I think is fantastic. And it's, it's, it's good for the American taxpayer. It's good for exploration. It's good for discovery. Um, and it's important for commerce. Um, I, I would also say that when NASA does, is one of many customers, we also want the providers, we want there to be multiple providers that are competing against each other on cost, on innovation, and on safety. And if we do those things, then it will drive down costs and increase access to space. So what you're seeing now is fundamentally transformational. Uh, but it's also true that NASA has been funding these projects for a very long time. We did commercial resupply to the International Space Station. We had SpaceX doing that. And we had uh, Northrop Grumman, with the time it was Orbital ATK or Orbital. Orbital Sciences got bought, combined with ATK, became Orbital ATK, and then it got bought by Northrop Grumman. So now, resupplying the ISS right now, you've got Northrop Grumman and SpaceX. And when we think about crew launching to the International Space Station, um, we've got Boeing, which is behind schedule, but we have SpaceX sending crew to the International Space Station as well. When I say Boeing is behind schedule, that's called the Commercial Crew Program. Uh, sp SpaceX, you know, they were launching commercial resupply, then they moved into commercial crew. With Boeing, they started at the same time, well, they started they started going straight into crew without all the experience doing commercial resupply. So it's, we can argue about whether or not they're behind. They didn't have the history SpaceX had that they said they wanted to jump in. We needed a second provider because we, need, we needed to have competition in the marketplace. Um, so those programs are underway right now. But then you also see Sir Richard Branson jumping into it. Um, you see with, with Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit. Um, you see uh, Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin. So there's, there's, and, and so there's, there's some, of the, some of the billionaires that are jumping in. Some of our you know, corporate contractors are jumping in. Um, and, and now there's this whole, this whole new world where SPACs are sh showing up. I don't know if you're familiar with SPACs, but uh, a lot of private money is funding a lot of venture capital in, in big, big ways. And, some of those companies are going from venture capital to publicly traded, you know, very quickly. Um, there's a lot of capital chasing the space markets right now. I think it's fantastic. I love it. It's good for America. It's good for innovation. It's, 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 it's wonderful. I would also say there's going to be failure in there. <laughs> um, and, and we have to remember that failure is not always a terrible thing. Markets need to be free. And when I say failure, I'm not talking about deaths. That's not what I mean. Companies will not be profitable uh, because there's going to be there's going to be winners and losers in any market. Um, but we have to remember that that ultimately that's that's what makes our system of economics kind of unique and 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 better than all of the others on the planet uh, because we do allow markets to work. And I think that's what you're seeing right now. And it's it's great for NASA to see it. We also have to think about when we think about commercial markets. You know, it's remote sensing, it's communications, it's the value of microgravity. It's not just tourists. Tourists are a part of it, for sure. But it's going to be the industrialization of space. It's going to be what are the materials we can create using microgravity. It's going to be, that's, I think, ultimately what's going to drive a lot of the investment um, in, in the future. Um, 
but I also think we need to learn from what's happening in low Earth orbit right now when we go to the moon. The, the value of getting to the moon is as soon as you're on the moon, it cuts your radiation dose in half because the radiation only comes from above. It can't come through the moon. So you've got to get to the surface of the moon. Then you've got a gravity well. Once you're in a gravity well, that, that pressure builds up in your head when you're in microgravity. It, it comes out. It, the pressure comes out of your head. And, and, then, and maybe you don't lose as much bone mass. Maybe you don't lose as much muscle mass. Um, and and all, of those, all of those challenges you have in microgravity can be reversed when you're in the gravity well of another world, whether it's the moon or Mars or somewhere else. The point is this. There's going to be markets available there. We just talked about the water ice a little bit. That's a huge market. There's resources there. We also need to think about the fact that um, you know, we think about rare earth metals. We've you guys have all heard about rare earth metals and how precious they are, platinum group metals. Well, they're not earth metals at all. They're asteroid impacts from billions of years ago. That's why they're so trace. You can hardly find them. The earth has this very active geology and this very, very active atmosphere and hydrosphere. And so nothing that impacted the earth billions of years ago is today where it was billions of years ago. It's not there. And when you find it, it's in very trace amounts. Well, the moon does not have an active atmosphere. It doesn't have an active geology. It doesn't have an active hydrosphere. Anything that impacted the moon billions of years ago is today right where it was billions of years ago. What does that mean? You could find massive deposits of platinum group metals. I can't tell you they're there. I don't know. I haven't seen them. Neither has anybody else. But I'm just telling you the probability is high. And so... There could be huge markets for the moon. What we have to think about as NASA is how do we develop a moon program where NASA is the customer rather than the owner and operator of the hardware? Because ultimately when those markets form, we want them to be free. We don't want the government controlling it. One of the initiatives that I had at NASA was to create the Artemis Accords. And in the Artemis Accords, we make sure that people understand. The Outer Space Treaty that we signed in 1976 says that nations cannot appropriate the moon for national sovereignty. You can't own the moon as a nation. And some have interpreted that and said, well, then nobody can own the resources of the moon. That is fundamentally untrue in international law. When we think about the oceans, you can't own the ocean, but you can own the tuna that you pull out of the ocean. You can own the oil that you pull out of the ocean, but you can't own the ocean. So you can't appropriate the ocean for national sovereignty. You can't appropriate the moon or celestial bodies for national sovereignty. But if you, if you apply your sweat and your equity and your tears and, and you go forward and you extract a resource from the moon, you ought to be able to own that. And that's going to be a huge, I think, potential market in the future as well. Not just at the moon, but asteroids and Mars. But one of the reasons we need to think differently as a country when it comes to space exploration is if we do it right, this will be driven largely by the private sector and NASA can be a customer. That's the way we need to be thinking about this. Um, and NASA will be a customer. We'll we're going to be the tenant customer to begin with. But we've got to be thinking, how, if, if, we pull, if we pull back, does it continue to go forward? And that's what we need to be thinking about. All right, we'll, we'll follow up. Is Mars going to be autonomous from the Earth? <laughs> you need to watch the, the TV show, The Expanse. That talks right. about it. It's an excellent show. Uh, so that, that's an interesting question. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we have an answer for that. Um, I, I, look, I don't want to sound too sci-fi here. But remember, there were people that came to the New World, which, of course, ultimately is where we are today in the United States of America. And they weren't autonomous when they came here. But eventually, we declared our autonomy. <laughs> um, so it, I don't know how it's going to unfold. Um, and I don't want to sound too you know, sci-fi-ish. But, but ultimately, I do believe we're going to go to the moon. We're going to create a way to stay there for long periods of time and maybe ad industrialize it. And we're going to do the same thing ultimately at Mars. It's not, you know, by 2030s, we want to be on Mars. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to be industrialized in there permanently at that time. Does it look like we're going to make the time frame for the Artemis project on the moon in 2024? A little bit of a summary. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so to start, um, 
I, I want to be very respectful of the current NASA administrator, Bill Nelson. Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm not going to, if, if the 2024 date can or cannot be met, I'm leaving that to him. I'm not going to comment on it. I think it's important that we have bipartisan kind of support for this program. And I've been thrilled to see that he's moving the program forward in just a great way. Um, so the, the question is, are we going to make it by 2024? I don't, I don't I, first of all, I don't know and I don't want to speculate. I'm going to leave that to NASA to, to say. At this point, they're saying they're still going for the 2024 date. I think that's, that's good. Push for it. Um, I would also say that Artemis is unique. When we think about Apollo. Um, we went to the moon. It was, it was basically a demonstration of our technological capability for this great power competition that was occurring at the time. And it was a wonderful, wonderful program. That's not what Artemis is about. Artemis is about going to the moon to stay. That is, that is a much different mission. Um, and using the water ice to learn how to live and work on another world for long periods of time. That's what the Artemis program is all about. Uh, the vice president, Mike Pence, was the one who you know, said, look, we, we, we need a program where we can tell young women that they're going to have opportunities to land on the moon. Because you go back to Apollo, all of, our, all of our astronauts came from fighter pilot backgrounds and test pilot backgrounds. We love them. But there were no opportunities for women in those days. And now we have this very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women. So when the vice president told me, we're going to go to the moon and we need people to understand that young ladies need to be thinking about their future, I was like, okay, we'll, we'll do that. And we, we came back and we decided we're going to call the program Artemis. Artemis in Greek mythology is the twin sister of Apollo. She, in fact, is the goddess of the moon in Greek mythology. So you could argue that maybe we named it incorrectly the first time. Um, so, so look, I, I think this is an important kind of symbol that uh, America is very different today than it was in the 1960s, and that's a good thing for all of us. Um, and, and we're looking forward to, um, you know, all of us on the moon, which is, which is fantastic. Yeah. Question about competition from other countries. Yeah, so um, certainly there's, there's, there's competition there already. I will tell you the challenge that we have in the United States, given our form of government, which is better than all the other forms of government on the planet, um, but it's still challenging. We never do the right thing until we've tried everything else. Um, <laughs> and I'm not the first person that said that. Um, look, we got into the moon race because we lost the race to orbit. We didn't have the first human in space. We didn't have the first human to orbit the Earth. We were behind. We, we, we were behind from the day Sputnik launched. And Americans were scared. And because of that, John F. Kennedy had to do something. And he's, he, had to, he had to create a goal that was far enough in the future that we could actually catch up and surpass. And that goal, of course, was the moon. He made that speech at my alma mater, Rice University. <laughs> Go Owls, hoot. Um, so, so we think about the race. It was tremendously valuable at the time. I think today, back then it was competition. Today it's really more about cooperation. How do we bring more partners in? Um, I know NASA has been reaching out to Russia to see how they would play if, if, if they want to. They may not want to, but they are invited. China is different because we have law that prohibits any kind of cooperation. Um, and and you know, we can argue about whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, being that one of the, one of the values of NASA is that tool of diplomacy. Um, so, you know, there, there, are, there are good and honest debates on both sides about whether or not it's a, we should partner with them on anything. Um, so the competition is the history. It's gonna, it is coming back. There is no doubt. I think it would be better if we could cooperate rather than compete when it comes to exploration. But the challenge is the competition these days is not about getting to Mars. There will be huge prestige bonus points for doing that. And, of course, China... They, they think of everything as comprehensive national power, they, you know, and that's what their goal is, do these stunning achievements. Uh, so certainly they want to do that. I think what will happen is um, they'll do something stunning. The United States of America will wake up, and we'll have to get back ahead. 
But I think a bigger competition lies on the national security aspects. That's, that's where everything looks really rough right now. And, and the United States took a while, but we did create the Space Force. Uh, people wanted to make political hay out of it, but it was the right thing to do. Um, and uh, the, the other thing I, I want to you talk about, what drives us to do these things. One of the reasons I think it's important to get to Mars, when I was a NASA administrator, three big discoveries. We found complex organic compounds all over the surface of Mars. Those are the building blocks for life. They exist all over Mars. They don't exist on the moon at all. Nothing. But on Mars, they're all over Mars. That's a big discovery. Second big discovery was that the methane cycles, methane is a complex organic compound, the methane cycles of Mars match the seasons of Mars. Does that guarantee life? No, it could be geological in nature, but the probability of finding life just went up again. And then, and then we think about the amount of plumes of methane coming from Mars. I've been told by some scientists that that's, there's no way that could be geological. So that's another big discovery. I'm not saying we've made the discovery, because as soon as I say that, it'll be on the headlines. Um, third thing is we believe we have found, well, there's some liquid 12 kilometers under the surface. I told you about the water ice at the ice caps. We now think there's liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. That's a big deal. Wherever there's liquid water on Earth, there's life. It doesn't matter if it's a raindrop or if it's a teardrop. If there's water, there's life there. Uh, that's, so that's a big discovery, if there's liquid water. The other thing is we know from spirit, opportunity, and curiosity, Mars had an, an ocean in its northern hemisphere. It was covered in ocean. Think about that. And, and, and be, so how does it have an ocean? Well, it had an ocean because in its history, when Mars was young, it had a molten core, just like the Earth has a molten core. Well, that molten core means you have a magnetosphere, just like the Earth has a magnetosphere. That magnetosphere is why we're all here. It protects us from the radiation of deep space. If we don't have that magnetosphere, we all die from radiation. So the magnetosphere protects the, the protected Mars from the radiation of deep space because it had that molten core. If it has that protection, it had a thick atmosphere and an ocean. In other words, Mars was at one time in its history, we know Mars was habitable. I'm not saying it was inhabited because we don't know that, but we know it was habitable. Now, if you, if you know that it was habitable and now you know that there's liquid water there today and you know that there's massive plumes of methane coming from the surface of Mars, and you know that it's covered in complex organic compounds. The question is, at what point do we find life? And whoever, you want to make sure that you blow the wheels off this thing? If we find life on a world that's not Earth, oh yeah, we're all going to be wanting to find out what's out there. Uh, everybody's going to be a scientist at that point. So, um, and I'm not talking about bunny rabbits. Uh, I'm talking, maybe there were bunny rabbits in the past, who knows. But I'm talking about like, you know, my, you know microorganisms or, you know, single-celled organisms, something like that. But I, I think that will be the biggest driver of all if we can make that discovery. And I think, I think that discovery, the other thing that's important, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> that discovery needs to be made by the United States of America. Because it will forever add chapters to history books and science books. And... That would be a huge mistake if we let somebody else take that lead while we watched them. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's an environmentalist question. Uh, the question was, would we be able to terraform Mars? Terraform to basically make it more Earth-like. Uh, turn it into a planet that has an atmosphere and trees and everything else. Um, there, there are very strong opinions uh, from the environmentalists, some, some, not all, uh, environmentalists that would say that we, we should never ever do such a thing. Um, there are others who say we absolutely should do that. The question is how would you do it? Well, you, first of all, you've got to create the magnetosphere that it lost billions of years ago. Well, how do you create that magnetosphere? Well, you put a nuclear device, as, as Mars is orbiting the sun, I'm just throwing this out there, I'm not, this, is not a, this is not a NASA mission, but it, it could be done. Um, as, as Mars orbits the sun, you could put 
a device between the sun and Mars that orbits the sun as well and is parallel with Mars and projects a magnetosphere that protects Mars from the radiation of the sun. And if you did that, um, yeah, there would be, there would be opportunities uh, to, to, you know, grow things on Mars that would grow on Earth, so. Yeah, that's a good question. The question is how vulnerable are we? Uh, he's concerned about the vulnerabilities. So am I. Um, you know, we, earlier I talked about all the things that we do where we're dependent on space, the way we communicate, navigate, produce food and energy, disaster relief, national security, weather prediction, climate, all these things that are important to understand and do for our humanity and for America are at risk. Uh, banking, the, the, the power grid, terrestrial wireless networks, your cell phone, they're all at risk. Um, and, and the enemies of the United States know that we're vulnerable there. So they're building capability to destroy those, those, those capabilities. So what we have to do as a nation, and it's the reason it was so important to create the Space Force, what we have to do is make sure that the, that the threats that you described have no belief that if they make the investments that they intend to make, that they're going to get an advantage over the United States. And if we can invest in the right things so that they don't get an advantage of the, over, over the United States, then they won't make the investments to begin with. Now that's the goal. Maybe they'll make those investments and then we get into a, a race, um, which is not really good for anybody, but at the end of the day, if you got to do it, you got to do it. It's a classic prisoner's dilemma kind of challenge. Um, so the, the, the reality is what we have to do is we have to look at all of the elements of national power and be good at them. We need to be good at the military piece as well. You know, right now, um, you know, the Space Development Agency is putting capabilities in space that are, there's going to be sensors involved and there's going to be communications involved and, um, and, it, and, it, and it, it really kind of, um, it's, it's going to be, I think, a, in a way, look, look maybe like uh, sensors that can provide missile defense. Um, we, we'll see. I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's always the appropriations process that gets in the way. <laughs> um, but but I, I have been an advocate of missile defense for a long time. Of course, that was the vision of Ronald Reagan back in the 1980s. And by the way, this is, you talk about that I and dime, the information power. If you go back to the Strategic Defense Initiative, which, you know, they, people said it's too expensive, it's not technologically achievable, it can't be done. They, they called it the Star Wars program to make fun of it, and I know we love Star Wars. Ronald Reagan called it the Star Wars program. As soon as they called it the Star Wars program to make fun of Ronald Reagan, he called it the Star Wars. He's like, yeah, it's the Star Wars program. Um, we spent this much money on the Star Wars program. But you know who spent a lot of money trying to counter the Star Wars program? The Soviet Union. Why? Because 13 years prior, they saw Americans walking on the surface of the moon. They believed we could achieve the outcome that Ronald Reagan was talking about. And Ronald Reagan talked about it a lot. Now, that was a piece of what pushed the Soviet Union over the cliff. I'm not saying it that's what ended the Soviet, but it was a piece of the overall puzzle. It's part of that I and dime information power um, that I think is so important. So um, all those things, uh, you know, keep in mind. It's, um, you got to be good at all, the entire dime. It's, 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 it's all of that. Our, those are all the elements of national power, diplomatic power, information power, the military power, and then the economic power. I'm just talking more about NASA today because that's, I was the head of NASA. Question right here. Uh, do you have a personal opinion as to when that happened? Oh. Do you know the answer to this? You're just setting me up? Well, no, I'm just... Okay. So the question was, do I have a personal opinion about Pluto? <laughs> the answer is yes. Pluto is a planet. Anybody who says otherwise is wrong. <laughs> the jack wagons that said it wasn't a planet did it prematurely. Um, so, 
the, the, the question, it's the taxonomy of anything. The, what, how, do you, how, do you, how do you label, um, how do you label things, right? Um, and there, there was a definition uh, back in 2000, I think it was 2006, the International Astronomical Society decided that they wanted to add a definition to a planet, and that was that you had to clear your own orbit around the sun. So you had to be big enough so that anything that was in your orbit around the sun would be attracted to you, and therefore you would clear your orbit around the sun. Basically, the, the mass of an object determines its gravity, and the bigger the object, the more everything it sucks in. And if you clear your own orbit, then you're a planet. If you don't clear your own orbit, you're not a planet. And they, they said, well, Pluto doesn't clear its own orbit. Um, well, well, now we're finding out that none of us clear our own orbits. <laughs> so there's that. So by that definition, you know, Earth has a Trojan asteroid following it around the sun. We're not a planet anymore. Um, I'm, being, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but I, I, here's what we know about Pluto. Because in 2015, when I was on the science committee, um, we flew New Horizons past Pluto. And we got, for the first time, it had never been explored before up close, but we learned that Pluto had a multi-layer atmosphere. We learned that Pluto has the largest um, glacier in the solar system. We learned that Pluto um, has five moons. We learned that Pluto has organic compounds. And we learned that Pluto has an ocean inside it that you can't see. There's liquid water, we think it's water, inside Pluto. And we, we, we discovered that because of the way it moves as it orbits. It, it, uh, it, there's something in there moving around. Now, people say Pluto's not a planet. I, I'm like, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. Pluto should be a planet. And it should be extremely interesting, and we should all want to go discover more about it. Uh, that's my opinion on Pluto. So, and, 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 and anybody who says it's not a planet, we, we, look, we've got to make sure people understand the truth here. Pluto is a planet. And <laughs> the NASA administrator, former NASA administrator, is all in. So thanks, right. for the, thanks for the question. Other questions? I grew up playing uh, asteroids. Yes. And um, I have seen recently that they were looking, NASA is possibly looking at shooting at an asteroid to destroy it. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, it's called the DART mission, Double Asteroid Redirect. So one of one of NASA's missions is to make sure that we don't get hit by something that destroys the Earth. Um, you know. Uh, there's, uh, you guys, some of, some of you may have grown up watching Bill Nye, the science guy. Um, so he has a saying that I think is pretty clever. Um, he says that the dinosaurs, the, the, the evidence is in, the dinosaurs never had a space program. <laughs> so the dinosaurs, obviously, the theory is, none of us were there, but the theory is an asteroid hit the Earth, and of course that killed off the dinosaurs. Um, so th the question is, if, if that were to happen again, how do we prevent it? So we do have a number of missions right now that are in space looking for objects that could be a threat to Earth. We are tasked by Congress um, to do that, and so we're always looking for these big bolides out there that could impact the Earth. The question is, what if we discovered one that was? By the way, there's nothing out there that's going to hit the Earth. Make sure everybody understands that. Um, one of the, we you know one we we did this mission um, out to Bennu um, called uh, Osiris Rex. Bennu was an asteroid in orbit around the sun, um, and and Osiris Rex went out there and 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 grabbed a sample of Bennu. I don't know if any of you guys remember reading about this in the paper at all, um, but it grabbed a sample of Bennu, and I think in 2023 it will return to Earth with that sample. Well, the reason we went to Bennu is because in the year like 2221, there was like a one in 200,000 or something chance that it could collide with the Earth. And so we're like, well, let's go take a look at this thing. Its probability is very low. It's a long time away, but let's go take a look at this thing. So we went out there, and when we tried to grab a sample of it, our spacecraft literally sunk into the thing. 
I mean, because it was so fragile. It was, it was, like, it was like dirt, particles of dirt, because it's not, it's not huge. I mean, I don't know how big it is. I think it's like a football field or something big. But with gravity, that again, mass equals gravity. <laughs> so when, when gravity is that light, by the way, don't quote me on that. That's probably not accurate. But the more mass there is, the more gravity there is. Um, but when, when, it, when it went down and tried to take a sample, it actually kept going into the planet, or the, into the little, into, into Bennu. And, and so it, we ended up take getting too much sample, and then we couldn't close the contraption that, that, that was grabbing it and that kind of thing. It was a big challenge. We figured it out. It's coming home now safely. We're going to look at that sample. The good news is Bennu, Bennu is so soft it would never make it through the Earth's atmosphere. That's the good news. And that's most 99% of the more that you, the asteroids that you ever see, you, you see these light shows at night where you see these shooting stars. Um, they, they don't make it through the atmosphere. The question is if we find something that could make it through the atmosphere, what do we do about it? That's what that mission, asteroid, double asteroid redirect is. So there's, out in space, there's this asteroid that's coming, you know, orbiting the sun. It's not going to touch the Earth ever, but it's orbiting the sun, and it's got, a, it's got its own little moon. It's a big, big asteroid with its own little moon that's also an asteroid. And the question is, if we move the moon, by moving the moon, can we then use the moon's gravity to move the asteroid? And, if, and the question is, if you can move it enough over the course of 100 years, how much does it change the trajectory? So those are the things that we're trying to learn right now. And it's one of the reasons we need big rockets, um, because ultimately, if we were to discover something, which probability is exceedingly low, but if we did, we'd want to be able to do something about it. Um, so yeah, we have a mission called Double Asteroid Redirect Dart, um, and that's that's what the purpose is. Fascinating. Any other questions? I mean, I have to. If you're not going to ask, is there is, is there one in the back? Okay. Yeah, so I think it's, um, so the, the question was, when you think about the moon and the earth, if we remove material from the moon, will that change its, its pull on the earth and change the orbit? Um, I, I think because the mass of the moon is so, so much, um, removing what we could possibly remove from it or use from it, I think it would not have an, it would not be a noticeable impact. Um, by the same argument, you could say, well, when we launch a rocket into space or we launch satellites into space, we're changing the mass of the Earth. And is that having an effect on the Earth-Moon relationship? Um, not that anybody's noticed, because the masses are so big. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I don't think we could ever get to that point. And I think more likely we would not be taking mass from, we would bring, be bringing mass to. <laughs> uh, it would probably be pretty balanced. And you're trying to bring a, um, a rock back from Mars, too, I saw. Uh, looking about 10 years or so, possibly, to get that rock back. That's right. So uh, Perseverance, which is our active robot on Mars right now, um, and Curiosity is still going as well, but Perseverance... Um, is, uh, is, 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 yeah, it, it is collecting samples. It's in, it's in the Jezero crater in a, in, a, in a river delta. Imagine that. There's a river delta on Mars. It's a dry delta. There's no water there. But it's clear that there was water there in the past. And we are in that river delta right now collecting samples that we can bring back to Earth and we can make assessments based on those materials as to whether or not there was life there in the past. Um, so yeah, that's called the Mars Sample Return Mission. Um, right now we're there collecting the samples with a very intelligent robot and a bunch of scientists at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. Um, and then, and then the, next, the next thing we gotta do is go get those samples and bring them home. So that's the next Mars mission. And the goal is 2026. And this question, uh, do we have another question? About nine minutes. Yeah, so it's not real time. So, so you think about this, the time of the signal. So the, the question is, how long does it take the signal to get from Earth to Mars? Well, there's a big, big delay there. So you can't do real-time robotics. You've got to kind of 
do something little and then see how it ends up and then try something. And so everything takes a long time. Curiosity has been on Mars for a decade. Um, curiosity has gone, I think, 11 kilometers in that time because everything has to be done so slow. That's why it's so important to get humans there because we can cover a lot more ground a lot faster and do a lot more science quickly. Um, let's see. Um, when we, th when we think about curiosity and, and the, let's see, you were talking about, um, oh, the, the delay. This is important. So one of the things NASA is investing in and we need to invest more in um, is something called quantum communications, which Einstein called spooky. And I'll explain it here um, for a guy that's, you know, not a quantum physicist. I'll try to explain it. So if you take two subatomic particles, think of two electrons. Take two electrons and you put them together. You can in what's called entangle them. Once they are entangled, you can separate them. And if you turn this one to the left, this one goes to the right instantaneously with no signal between the two. Now if you take this electron and you take this electron and you put them on opposite sides of the solar system, and you spin this one to the left, this one will spin to the right instantaneously with no communications between them. That's why Einstein called it spooky. How does this work? Quantum entanglement. If you put one on one side of the galaxy and the other on the other side of the galaxy and you spin one to the left, the other one will spin to the right instantaneously, no communications between them. Once you figure out how to communicate using the system, and it's not as easy as I've described, um, because they can become unentangled very easily, but it, once you can utilize that as a means of communication, that means communications can happen where there is no signal, which means it can't be spoofed, it can't be jammed, it can't be hacked. You would never be able to know that a signal was even made, let alone be able to do anything about it. Quantum communications is a fundamental game changer for the balance of power on Earth. That's how important it is. And we need to figure it out, and we've got to be the best at it. Um, there have been some experiments done. China's been working on it very extensively with the cooperation of Italy, which I think is a mistake, and I was very clear about that as the NASA administrator. Um, we have to be preeminent in that, and, and it's something NASA needs to invest in. But the value for NASA is we could put a robot on Pluto and do real-time robotics, right? Because we could, we could send robots all throughout the solar system and be able to do instantaneous communications. Ra when, when you think about Pluto, I, what is the, I'm trying to remember the length of time it took for the signal to get back from Pluto, but it was, I want to say it was, measured in days. Um, I, I don't remember for sure. Um, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big deal to figure out communications. A couple more questions. Are there real astronauts? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that's, the <coughs> that's the million dollar question. Now, it's just us. Nobody's, nobody's listening. <laughs> yeah, you right. can just tell us whatever. We won't talk, will we, after this? What, what so... Wait for it. I don't know. I, I don't I mean, certainly I've, I've seen like the 60 minutes piece and everything. Um, not, if, if, you know, I will tell you this. Is there intelligent life out there? I don't know. Um, let's see. So when I was at NASA, there was a 17-year-old intern who, um, was looking at a binary star system that was 1,300 light years from Earth. Um, and so when, when you have a binary star system, you got one star orbiting another star. And so there's, there's fluctuations in the amount of brightness that comes from that star based on that orbit. And you can measure that, and you can see what is the period of the orbit and that kind of thing. Well, this 17-year-old, while he was measuring you know, those changes, Every once in a while, there was a unique flicker, a, a unique dimming that was very faint, but he picked it up, and he saw that that's weird. And by the way, it's happening 
regularly on a scheduled time. It was a planet that was orbiting this binary star system 1,300 light years from the Earth. I think that's what it was. I, I don't know. That was a 17-year-old intern at NASA that made that discovery. Here's the thing. We are discovering new planets around stars all the time now. All the time. And when we think about how many stars are in our own galaxy, we're talking about 100 billion stars. We think about how many galaxies there are in the universe, we're talking about 100 billion galaxies. There's this famous picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, there's a spot in the sky where there's no stars. Um, it's about the size of Abraham Lincoln's eyeball. If you, if, if, if you hold a penny at arm's length and you look at Abraham Lincoln's eyeball, um, there's a point in the sky where you can't see very many stars. And so what happened is they took the Hubble Space Telescope early in its, early in its time and they pointed it at that one point in the sky for like 13 days. And they got an image back. I say 13. It was, it was weeks. When they got that image back, there, was, there were all of these stars. But they weren't stars. They were thousands and thousands of galaxies. I think this was in 1994. For the first time, we realized <laughs> that there's more galaxies out there than we ever even thought about or dreamed about. So we think about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. We think about 100 billion galaxies that are out there. Now we know that there are at least dozens of, of planets orbiting every, every galaxy or every, every star. Um, we, we look, we, we're finding new moons around Jupiter and Saturn. I think Jupiter, we're up to like 74 moons or something now. Every time we turn around, we're discovering something new, orbiting, orbiting Jupiter or Saturn. Um, so the, the bottom line is this. There's a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> and and um, you know, whether or not there's intelligent life, I have, I have zero idea. Um, what, I, what I do know is that the probability of finding life in our own solar system is going up. And I think we got to find it. And I think if we did find it, it would transform what, how we think about everything else. And that's why I love space. I mean, it's never-ending opportunity to learn. And uh, as we talk about here with Will Rogers, one of the things he was was a lifelong learner. And space is where you can be a lifelong learner. And we appreciate everything you've done. It's so exciting that you came here uh, to Claremore and your service to our, our country as a congressman and then as director of NASA and then to take some time here to, uh, to speak to the, to the groups and to the kids and everybody. We sure do appreciate your time, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Tad. I appreciate it. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Russell up in the booth, and I want to thank a uh, couple of our ropers that made the popcorn out there. There's still a few uh, bags left, so please grab some as you leave, and uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Jim.